church today. Would you stand with me? Let's all stand up together and sing. Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. No could carry that kind of weight. It was my doom till I met you. I was grieved. It was my turn till I made you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I everybody man it really is a glorious day out there this morning huh what a beautiful morning i'm so glad you're here um, those of you who are here in person and those of you who are joining us on live stream welcome to worship at westwood church my name is scott christensen i'm the senior pastor here at westwood and i'm really excited to welcome you to worship today hey have a seat for me will you so here's the deal you probably noticed this as you were coming in but I know this feels like making an announcement after it's already happened, but um, it's what I get paid for, so I'm going to do it anyway, right? So 
every room, we decided to change a little bit of our seating configuration, and we're still trying to keep social distancing and cleaning between services and all that in mind. So now, and this for you at home on live stream, when you're able to come back in person, now you're going to see as you come into the worship center, there'll be kind of a, a sign at the beginning of each row, and some signs will say green, which means go, and some signs will say red, which means stop. If it's a green row, feel free to sit there. If it's a red row, please don't. And as always, between family groups, make sure you leave at least three seats between you, and that keeps us all in social distancing compliance and all that. I had somebody ask me uh, the other day, so what happens if I'm like sitting next to my friend who I see all the time? And here's the thing, I'm not going to get in your business, all right? So if you're sitting next to somebody and you're doing it, I'm, I'm guessing you choose to, and I probably won't come over and tap you on the shoulder, um, unless you're making a scene, in which case I will, all right? But so if you, you, you're all big boys and girls, you know how to do that, but in terms of keeping between groups who don't see each other all the time, and we want to make sure you keep three seats there. So it's as simple as it can be, right? Green means go, three seats apart, keep your masks on, we're all good. Everybody got that? All right. Hey, one of the things we want to do this morning is welcome our boys and girls in our special way by inviting Miss Michelle up front. Let's do that right now. Ready? Good. Good. Yeah, it's good to see those of you at home, too. I know you love to wave at me on your TVs, and I love that, too. So it's good to see you. I brought some things with me today. You shout out what it is, okay? Parents, you can help, too. Yeah, a remote control. Who loves a remote control? I do. Yes. Okay, now shout out, everyone. Who uses it the most at your house? Oh, immediate pointing. <laughs> to mostly dads, it seems. Yes, interesting. Andy, it's all you? Yes. We all like to have it, though, right? If we could just have it all the time, and nobody else got a choice, and it was just mine, 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 and I got to choose everything that's on TV all the time, wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, because we all like to be in control, right? We all have our favorites. Okay, I have a couple other things. Some of these are a little old school. Have you ever seen anything like that? What's that? Yep, video game controllers, same thing, you're in control. I see some of you play games, and whew, I think I could do this in front of your face and you wouldn't even know, because you're in control, right? You're controlling what's on the screen, making it happen, hopefully winning. Have you ever been playing a game and you're all in control and then it gets unplugged or the batteries go out? Or even on the remote control, the batteries go out? Isn't that so frustrating? Because you were all in control, maybe you were winning, and then it doesn't work. You're not in control anymore, and it's so frustrating, isn't it? The truth is we all want to be in control all the time, don't we? It's just a human thing. We all want what we want right now, and we want to control it. But it isn't that way, is it? We see things all around us all the time that we're just not in control of, are we? They happen, we wish they didn't, but we're not in control. Well, Pastor Scott today is going to talk more about Psalm 91, and in that psalm, that book in the Bible, it points us to he who is in control. It's not me, and it's not you, it's God, right? And when we're focused on he who is in control, how different that feels. We let go of this right? Just, I'm not in control, but the one who is, I trust. He is faithful. He's the maker of heaven and earth, and he's in control. That feels pretty good. One of the things Psalm 91 points us to is to worship and praise and thank him for being the one in control. So let's do that today. You put your hand on your heart, little ones, and let's talk to him. God, we thank you for being in control. We are not even though we want to be, today we acknowledge that you are. We praise you for it, and we thank you for it. And all God's kids and people said, amen. Thank you. If you would like to go to Sunday school, you can follow me up. Thank you, Mr. Michelle. The
Remote controls at our house are lodged right by my chair, right where they belong. Hey, I'm glad you're here this morning. We want to make a couple of announcements just to uh, let you know about a few things happening here at Westwood Church. Um, um, and I um, want to let you know, first of all, that we are beginning Wednesday Night Live very soon. In fact, it will be happening September 9th. Um, and it's a little bit of an abbreviated night from what you're perhaps used to. There's no meal right now because of the whole uh, virus thing and all that. And we're going to have the classes a little shorter. So know that when you when September 9th, 9 hits. But the most important thing for those of you who have little ones is we really need you to register them because we have a cap on how many people we can put in a room and we got to figure out how to uh, jockey all that around, make sure everybody who can come want, who wants to come can come and all that. Um, so on our website, westwoodchurch.net, you'll see it very clearly as a place to register for Wednesday Night Live. If you would do us the huge favor of registering your kids, and if you have not done so already, do it today. Uh, register them so that we can get all of that those counts together and know how to, to uh, make all that happen. So just want to make sure you're aware of that. We would really appreciate it. We also want to let you know about an event that's coming up here uh, in just a little over a month uh, where we're going to be hosting in person a video marriage event. Um, now, this is initially supposed to be a marriage night, but you see that word crossed off because we're really trying, we've been kind of bouncing lots of ideas off one another, trying to come up with the best time frame to offer this to give the most people the chance to be a part. So we're going to try to make this a 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. thing instead of an evening thing. Uh, and what our hope is, is that we'll also have the, a meal in the middle of that and working out the safety details to make that happen, and also child care for those who uh, need it and want to take advantage of it here. So we want you for now just to mark that date on your calendar. It's Saturday, October 3rd, again, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, now, I don't want to suggest that anyone's lives have been stressed nor have their marriages in the past six months. But if that is you, and even if it's not, I want to encourage you to take this day, if at all possible, to be a bit of a recalibration for setting our most important, humanly speaking, relationship in order if we're married, which is our spouse. So this is a great opportunity and really a relatively small commitment to make that happen. Uh, there is a financial cost. It's $30 which will include uh, the meal that we're providing and the child care that we're providing. Uh, but if that's an issue, as always, please let us know. We'll make it happen even if that is a prohibitive cost for you. So, uh, yeah, for now, I just want to make sure you mark that date on your calendar. If you want to go register now at our website, westwoodchurch.net, you can do that, but you'll be getting more information in the coming weeks directing you right to the registration link. So uh, for now, mark it on your calendar, talk about it, and please plan to join us if you can. Excellent. Hey, just a reminder, folks. Offering here at Westwood Church now is done a couple of ways. One of them is there's a box as you exit. And if you brought an offering this morning, you can flip it right in there. Otherwise, on our website, westwoodchurch.net, is a donate button. And it gives you an opportunity to donate electronically. And um, I say this a lot, and I really mean it. We so appreciate your uh, generous financial support for this ministry. It enables all that to happen. So I'm glad you're, thanks for doing that. Well, now we're going to invite you to stand up and discreetly or overtly wave at all the people around you. Do that right now. I got to thinking during uh, Miss Michelle's uh, children's message about how, uh, you know, these next two songs really do pertain to... Uh, letting go of control and I love the song this next one that my kids have sung since they were little called you never let go and uh, the good part is we can let go because he doesn't and he holds on to us so let's sing through that today
for my God is with me. If my God is with me, whom then shall I? throughout my life that I can look back at times that I've wanted to give up and he's not let that happen and so I love this um, Psalm 91 where it reassures us that we have that comfort in that hiding place when we need to, to, to rest in him and so this next song uh, had been sung in uh, previous places I worked and it's not new and it's just but it's beautiful so if you don't know the words that's okay it's pretty simple it sounds like this i have found myself a hiding place i have found myself a secret space in the shelter of almighty's In the safety of the Savior's arms. The chorus sounds like this. I will run to the hiding place. I will run to the hiding place. Draw me ever closer. I have found myself high. 
As Todd mentioned, uh, Psalm 91 so eloquently describes that hiding place, that place of safety in the care, the shadow of the Almighty. But it's not the only place in Scripture that does that. That theme is echoed throughout the entirety of the Bible. And last week we used as a confession uh, Romans 8 that describes that very same thing. So just to show you that it echoes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So join me as we do the same thing again this morning and remind ourselves that nothing can separate us from God's love. It'll be clear who reads what when, so join me. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his only son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. And who will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in a place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. What can think ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? 
as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. And how do we know that love best? That love is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Have a seat for me, will you? Well, my friends, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And uh, I know that you know people who need to hear that message. I know that in all of our lives, there are folks, maybe they're friends or neighbors or uh, co-workers, uh, probably co-workers you haven't seen in six months, but co-workers nonetheless, who need to hear that nothing can separate them from God's love. So we're going to pray for those folks this morning, and I'll give you some time of quiet to pray for whoever it is that God brings to your mind. I and mean, I know that all of us, too, need to be reminded of that, that all of us need to, to tangibly feel God's love, and so I'll give us some time to, to pray about that, too. Let's pray together. Lord God, I, I believe that with all my heart, that nothing can separate us from your love. I'm counting on it, not only for this life, but for the next. All of us are. But all of us also have people in our lives who need to know that truth, that just the way they are right now, God loves them and will never love them more and could never love them less. For those folks, for the things in our own lives that we need your touch on, in this time of quiet, we pray. Lord, may your healing touch, your powerful love, invade every person's life who was mentioned, every situation that was brought to your attention. May our trust in you grow exponentially as we lean into your love. May it be so. Amen. So we, uh, we have a kid living in Houston now, which means, among other things, we're now taking a very personal interest in the current hurricane season. Uh, Houston didn't get hit in this last series of uh, storms this week, but it was close. Um, and you know, it's, it's a weird thing thinking that you have a kid dealing with hurricanes. And we've always been Midwest people. So tornadoes, we know, we understand. But hurricanes, we're just not used to that. Now, I've never experienced a hurricane personally, but I was in a major earthquake quake once. It was the Northridge, Northridge earthquake in California. It was January 17, 1994, and my wife Kathy was pregnant with uh, our first child, uh, Jacob. And we traveled to L.A. because I had to do these mid-certification interviews for my ordination process with the denomination. So our plan was is to go and spend some time, go and have me do the things I needed to do in L.A., and then we'd spend a few days just having some fun. That was the plan. Until the middle of the night, the ground started to shake. I mean, technically it was 4.30 a.m., and the earthquake registered a magnitude of 6.7. It was, had one of the highest land speeds, whatever that means, I actually don't know, ever in a re residential area. The initial earthquake lasted somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds. And then there were actually two large aftershocks, one about a minute from the first earthquake and one 11 hours later. 
and Kathy and I felt them all. When the first quake hit, it uh, woke us up, of course, and I remember the whole room, the hotel room, just buckling. And my wife said something like, wow, that felt like a big one. And then I, being very wise at 34 years old at that time, said, no, this is California. They have these all the time. This is no big deal. So at that point, Kathy turned on the television, and we saw the news person hiding under his desk. And there were televisions that, you know, they used to have televisions lying in those new rooms. They were all down on the floor, uh, broken up. And I remember thinking, well, maybe this was a big deal after all. Turned out it was. Over 50 people lost their life in the initial quake. The damage was incredible, and we drove around L.A. We saw a lot of this, including the total collapse of the Northridge Meadow apartment complex. Whole interstate exchanges came apart. I read that people felt this earthquake as far away as Las Vegas. And I can't tell you how odd, how disturbing it is to feel the very ground under your feet move and shake. I mean, it it seems like we should be able to trust the ground not to move. But earthquakes happen. They're going to happen. We live in an uncertain world. Uncertainty in life, uh, we know it pretty well right now, don't we? Things or people that we thought we could count on let us down. Life takes turns that we could never have predicted. I mean, think about this. How much has changed just in the last six months? Last year, when school started, we never could have guessed that this year we'd be wearing masks uh, to school, to the store, to church, that some of our students would, would be remote learning, that some of them would be social distancing at school. We never could have guessed there would be no Husker football. Now, in the middle of the season last year, we might have hoped there would be no Husker football. But we never could have guessed. Uncertainty, by definition, means things happen that we can't anticipate and we can never control. Last week, we began this two-part message from Psalm 91, a psalm that I believe contains some gifts from God for uncertain times, kind of like these. And I mentioned last week three gifts. I talked about the gift of a safe place, that our committed connection with God is our best place of refuge, a foundation that helps us deal with uncertainty, a solid rock for us to stand on. We talked about a safe place, our relationship with God. We talked about God's promises, the gift of God keeping his promises, that God promises to care for all of us who follow him. Now, that promise never means that we won't have trouble in life. God never promised that. And, and God's care always happens God's way. But nevertheless, God promises to care for those of us who follow him. And then last week, we, the last one last week we talked about is we noticed that Psalm 91 gives us a pathway to patience instead of panic. What is panic? Panic is, uh, is fear on rocket fuel. And nobody wants to live their life in fear. But we can replace fear that we have in life when uncertainty hits with patient trust in God. In fact, the only way to deal with fear in our life is to replace that fear we have in these uncertain times with a confidence in a God who's able to rise above every and all uncertainty. So that was my recap of last week. I sound like Netflix now, don't I? This week, I want to show you three more gifts for uncertain times from Psalm 91. So in order to do that, let's read it. In fact, I hope you've been uh, reading this psalm every day this week. Uh, My advice to you is you might want to keep on reading it because it does not look like these uncertain times are ending just yet. But for now, stand with me and I will read it. Psalm 91, God's prescription for uncertain times goes like this. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, 
nor the arrows that fly in the day. Don't, do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor disasters that strike at midday. Although a thousand fall at your side, although 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes. See how the wicked are punished? If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up in their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I'll protect those who trust in my name. And when they call on me, I'll answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. And I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. My friends, these beautiful words are the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we, we claim this psalm today. I claim it for myself as I struggle with uncertainty. I claim it for my friends in this room, all of us dealing with uncertain times. But I suspect there are some folks here today who are especially troubled, who come with real burden. And I claim it especially for them, that they may hear from you, Holy Spirit, that you will never leave them and forsake them. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. So I was uh, following my own advice this week and reading, well, actually listening to while I work out uh, this psalm, Psalm 91, when one verse that I hadn't really thought much about really stuck out to me. It was almost as if the Holy Spirit was saying, hey, don't miss this. And it's verse 7. Though 10,000 fall at your side, or I'm sorry, though 1,000 fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not trust you, will not touch you. Tradition says that Moses wrote this psalm, which would make it very ancient, but, you know, the truth is we don't really know for sure. Regardless, it was obviously written to a time to a people for whom war was a very common reality of life. And so lots of ancient literature, not just this, but lots of ancient literature has war metaphors in it, and this psalm obviously is no exception. And I know we don't like to think in war metaphors in this day and age, but, but try to hear the meaning of this verse. It describes what utter disaster looks like. The psalmist stands in the middle of a battle, and all around him his people have fallen. It looks like God has abandoned him. It looks like his death is imminent. In other words, to human, the human eye, to the human mind, it seems as if all is lost. Now, I hope you've never had to experience that situation in a battle, but we've all been there in other ways, other kinds of battles, right? That job you counted on doesn't come through. That relationship you hoped in falls apart. Health struggles. Finances are rocked. Parenting, you find out, is so hard. Pandemics, injustice, divisions, betrayal, pain. I think we all know the feeling of looking around us and thinking, the wheels have come off, and I'm all alone. But the psalmist goes on to remind us and that, that although that reality that we see around us is powerful, there is a reality that we cannot see that is even more powerful. In other words, just because the situation that we're in seems like it's gone off the rails, God hasn't abandoned us or it and is still at work, whether we see it or know it right now or not. Those of us who follow Jesus are citizens of his kingdom. And, so much, and, and what that means is much of his kingdom is lived right now in faith. So it's vital for us to look at the uncertainty in which we live in right now with faith eyes and acknowledge that what we see around us is not all there is, nor all there ever will be, that God hasn't abandoned us. In fact, he gives us the gifts we need to deal with life today. Last week, we talked about three of those gifts. There's three more, I think, that Psalm 91 offers us in uncertain times. And here's gift number four, permission not to be in control. Now, I am admittedly a control freak. And this COVID season is very hard on us control freaks. 
It's a pervasive reminder that we are really not in control of the virus, of, of other people's behavior, of decisions that get made for us. COVID is a reminder of what actually is always true anyway, that we're far less in control of our own lives than we really think we are. But COVID kind of rubs, rubs the face of us control freaks in that fact, which is irritating, but probably necessary. What Psalm 91 does so well is remind us that we are not in control, but that God is never out of control. I mean, look at who takes center stage in this next section of the psalm, which is about verse 9 through 14. It says, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, he will order his angels. They, the Lord's angels, will hold you up. The Lord says, I will rescue. I mean, I can't help but notice that in that part of the psalm, there's not much of me in control, but there's a whole bunch about God being in control. And maybe that's sort of the point. You know, it's exhausting to try to manage what is beyond our capacity, isn't it? I think that's where this sort of low-level depression that I think a lot of us are feeling right now, I think it's part of our culture right now, I think that's where, where this thing, where that low-level depre depression kind of come from. We try to do what we're not able to do, and it wears on us. I can't tell you how many nights in my life I have paced or stared at the ceiling, trying to scheme or think my way out of situations, only to find that my plans didn't amount to much because I wasn't in control. You know, when we moved to the house that we live in right now in North Omaha, in the backyard, there were this ring of concrete pillars. They stuck up about the ground about like this, but they were like this big. I mean, they were deep. And I didn't like them, so I determined to dig them out. So I dug every one of them out, but the problem was most of them I couldn't pick up. I couldn't move. They were too heavy for me. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't try. I tried. I tried to break them with a sledgehammer. I tried, but they, they, that didn't work. I tried to drill them out with a cement bit. I tried to lever them. I tried to pound them. And I, I did get a few of them out, maybe three or four by myself. But most of them, I either had to kind of topple and cover over again, or I had to get some help, read my sons. Because to lift them was beyond my ability. And I nearly killed myself trying until I gave up. Controlling life around us is simply beyond our ability, we, but is not beyond the ability of our God. When we give up trying to be control of everything, see, see that what's beautiful about giving up control is that when we give up trying to be control of everything, we can also give up this illusion of perfectionism, of trying to make everything perfect. We can accept what is, usually far less than perfect, and trust in God to make it right. And when we do, when we give God control and stop trying to control everything ourselves, that's when, that's when we can really experience victory, this kind of victory. Verse 13, you will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions, <clears throat> excuse me, and serpents under your feet. But that kind of victory only comes when we let God lead the charge, do the fighting, not us. So how do we do that? How do we surrender control to God in uncertain times? Well, I think one of the ways we do it is we force ourselves <clears throat> excuse me, to acknowledge the reality that we don't get to control everything. We say that out loud. I'm not in control of everything. We, we, we say it to God. We tell the truth, which is that some things are just too heavy for us to lift. And I also think we have to, to discipline ourselves not to act without God's leading. And that is so hard because at least for me, my natural bent is to be a problem solver. So I would prefer to act sooner than later. I'd prefer to make a decision and act on it. The problem with control freaks like me is what we tend to do is we tend to pray and ask God to be involved. And then we forget that we did that. and We just make and execute our own plans, leaving no room for God to actually answer our prayers. But I believe that God's trying to coach me in my life to make my first step to bring that issue to him in prayer and then make that my second step also and then leave room for God 
to do his thing. I'm trying to find a pace of life that allows God to initiate and puts me in the right frame to hear and respond. It's a gift to surrender control to our sovereign God. Gift number four. Gift number five from Psalm 91 is in uncertain times is this. God's presence. God promises that wherever we go, he'll go with us. That whatever we experience, he'll stand with us. Verse 15. And when they call on me, I will answer. And I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. Hear that? I'll be with them in trouble. Psalm 91 reinforces the truth that that really the entirety of the Bible teaches us in word and story. And that's this. God wants to be involved in our lives with us. You know, I was reading um, this. I couldn't help but think about Jesus and his disciples. One of the the best things for me that the television series, The Chosen, which if if you've not seen it, um, you really need to do that. You can find it on YouTube. It's just tremendous. But one of the biggest insights into Jesus from that program to me was just how relationally involved Jesus was with his people. He was not the type of leader who sort of forged ahead and forced his his followers to try to keep up. Jesus was in the midst of his people, laughing and crying and conversing and sitting in silence. He was involved in their lives. And he still wants to be. God wants to be so interwoven in our day-to-day life that we really believe that we're not in this thing alone. And we're not. That he stands with us. The psalm says, when we call upon the Lord, he will answer. When we look to him in uncertain times, he will be there with us. When we need him the most, he will rescue. See, the proof of God's love for us is not that we go through difficult times. We don't live in a world that that allows for us not to experience difficulties. The test of God's love for us is that he goes with us through those difficult times. You know, over the years, I've been with lots of parents in hospitals sitting beside their, their kids. Uh, who are dealing with medical issues, some of them life-threatening. And, and what always impresses me is the love of those parents for those kids is shown by the fact that they're there in that hospital with them, sitting by the bedsides of their kids, comforting them, making sure they know that they're not alone. That love, that love is the kind of love God has for us. But a hundred million times, that's the same love that God has for us. Psalm 91 reminds us that that the amazing gift of of the amazing gift of God's presence in our lives. And if you're not feeling that right now, and that happens to all of us, I think, we lose track of, we stop feeling God's presence, let me just encourage you to keep seeking it. Stay in the scripture, stay in prayer. Stay in community. Cry out to God. And if you don't have the words to cry out to God, that's perfectly okay. Use the words from the Psalms, of the, the Psalms of Lament that I talked about last week, as language to cry out to God. Let me just read a couple of verses from Psalm 42. Oh God, my rock, I cry. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones, they scoff. Where is this God of yours? That's Psalm 42. Waiting patiently for God to make his presence known is a courageous act of faith. But when we seek him, we'll find him. When we knock, he will answer. Believing that, that, believing that truth, it, even when we don't feel it, that's the very substance of faith. God's gift to us in uncertain times is himself walking with us. One last gift from this psalm that I want to talk about, and it's found in the very last verse. It says, I'll reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. This is a reminder that ultimately our life here on earth is only a tiny minuscule part of our eternal life that, that, that we who follow Jesus have, that we who follow Jesus will live with him forever. Before I uh, left on vacation this uh, this summer, I got a COVID test. 
Um, how many of you have had that lovely experience of getting a COVID test? Raise your hand, those of you in the room. You can raise your hand if you're at home too. Yeah, um, it's probably not something you want to do for fun on a beautiful uh, summer morning. But honestly, it wasn't that bad. Um, I was negative, by the way. Those of you who are getting up to leave right now, I was negative. Um, the saving grace of a COVID test, uh, of this uncomfortable experience of them sticking a giant Q-tip up your nose to your brain, is that it doesn't last very long. It's over in a few seconds. And the nurse who administered my test kept telling me that, almost done, almost done, almost done. Knowing that it doesn't last very long helps you get through it. Knowing the benefits of, of, of getting that test that you know whether you have this virus or not makes it worth getting through it. See, tough times in like that are, uh, life are like that too. Tr honestly, they usually don't last. But even when they do or feel like they do, um, those of us who follow Jesus, we have another future ahead of us that will not include hard times. Jesus said this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'll come and get you and you will always be with me where I am. And you know the, the way to where I'm going. And of course, then his disciples said, well, where's the way? And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, maybe knowing that we have this beautiful future ahead of us doesn't help in the midst of pain. But folks, pain does not last. Our eternal life with Jesus does and will. I guess that does help. At least it seems to help me. The gift of this psalm is a reminder of the gift of eternal life with Jesus. And that's something, folks, that no uncertainty can ever touch. Some of you maybe know that um, this past uh, Monday I had a birthday. I turned the big 6-0. I know I don't look a day over. Okay, I know I look 60. Fine. There are some benefits, by the way, to being 60. One of them is senior discounts. I laugh at all of you who are paying full price for Wendy's Chili right now. Actually, there are others. My kids are all adults, so I don't have to do remote learning. I'm praying for those of you who do. But also, there's a bit of life wisdom that comes from being a little older. I no longer feel the same need I used to have to impress people because I've recognized the fact that I can't anymore. There are blessings with uncertain times, too. The primary one being that we're, we are reminded in uncertain times that we really live and move and have our being in our relationship with God. Psalm 91 is a beautiful and eloquent reminder of that truth, that God is our certainty in an uncertain world. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I, I pray that I would be reminded of that because I'm pretty sure that in my life, the ground is going to shake again. I'm pretty sure that in my life, there are going to be times where I say, I don't understand what's going on. How could this be? I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have doubts and struggles. And I'm guessing that everybody in this room will too. And yet, and yet, we can still count on you, the rock that's never mo that never moves. The rock that if we build our house on you, no storm can touch. May we see you really as the uncertainty, not the situation in which we live. May it be so. Amen. Hey gang, I invite you to stand up and we'll sing.
nothing new my hand I bring simply to the cross I clean naked I like that, a little jazzy version of Rock of Ages, huh? I like that. Yeah, that was great. You can clap for that. That's all right. You know, here's the thing. I really do believe this. Someday this whole pandemic thing is going to be over. And we're going to look back on this time, um, and we're going to be amazed at all that happened and all that we went through. But there'll be other troubled times, right? There'll be other uncertainties. Who knows what they'll be? What, what remains consistent is not the situation that we live in, but the God that we serve. May that God guide you, protect you, enable you to trust him this week. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, next week we begin a new series, still talking about uncertainty, but we're going to be following from the Old Testament, the life of Abraham and Sarah through a whole series of events and uh, their incredible story. If you don't, you don't know that story, or if you do, come back for it. Thanks for being here. See you next week.